For those of you who are a regular part of real life, you're very familiar with a Greek word that we use all the time around here. But for those of you who are somewhat new and to those of you who are tuning in on our video format, let me just quickly talk to you about this word oikos. Oikos is the Greek word that literally translated means household or family. But understand that in the context that that word was used, it always stood for everybody who was within their sphere of influence. When we think about family, we think about my mom and my dad and my brothers and sisters, my children. But oikos really means all those people that are within your world. It's your boss and the people you buy and sell with. It was the people who lived in their home and surrounded them and their neighbors. And so we refer to that as oikos being what, those of you who know? my world. And so I'm excited to let you know that beginning on the 15th of February, we're going to go into a very brief but vital series to reintroduce you to this important concept of oikos. That's why we call it reaching our worlds for Jesus, because God has given to every one of us an oikos, people that we have been tasked with and privileged to reach for Jesus. And so I hope you'll be joining us and tuning in for those and uh, we're going to have a great time sharing in that together. Right now, we are in our series called Thrive. Let me remind you, this is an acrostic, and we have traveled through quite a bit of this word. The T in Thrive stands for trust. And so we refer to the fact that you can't thrive in life if there's not a solid foundation upon which to build your life. So we trust in the word of God. The H in Thrive is for heal. We wanted to remind you that maybe you're in a season of your life where you're struggling, you're facing difficulties. You might say, well, I'm not thriving. But even when we have a season of what we would call pruning back, that Jesus, two things, one, is still working in your life during that time, and two, he's pruning you back for a season of even greater fruitfulness that is ahead of you. And so if the T is trust, the H is what? Heal. Heal. That's right. The R in thrive is for risk. We talked about this idea that every part of the Christian walk is a faith walk and that God is calling us to get involved with the things that he is doing and to trust him that way enough to put our lives on the line to join him in what he does. So the R stands for risk. The I in Thrive stands for invest. We talked about that this last weekend that we were here. This idea that we as a people are willing to give our time and our money and our resources because we believe that when we invest in God's kingdom, the rewards are eternal. There is a return for our work. And I have to tell you what a great response we have had to this invest sermon. So many of you stepped up and said, where can I serve? How can I help? I'm excited to begin to trust God with my finances. And so thank you so much for that. We look forward to next week, our all-in weekend, when we're just going to say, what would it look like if every one of us could trust God with a tithe, 10% of uh, what we make in a week? And we're just going to see what that looks like and how that allows us just to go forward and to continue to reap the rewards of the kingdom. So I stand for what? Invest. So now we come to V in Thrive, and V stands for for value. Say that word with me, value. The most valuable things in life are not things. They are people. It's not always easy to see that. Let's face it, people don't always make life easy on us. It's hard to value people at times when they're so complex. They're so frustrating. They're hard to figure out. Come on, let's admit it. How great the world would be if everybody was just like you, right? Wouldn't it be so much easier? Wouldn't this world be such a great place? Everyone should be like you, shouldn't they? But alas, everyone is not just like you. In fact, as we begin to talk about this idea of valuing people, it's hard to even understand so many others. Let's face it, half of the population isn't even the same gender as you. Now, men, we know how difficult that makes it, right? Amen. <laughs> and honest women in the room would admit they don't always get men either. 
Just wanted to give an opportunity for some return fire there. And uh, <laughs> we understand that. It's almost self-evident. But I thought you might get a kick out of us just exploring that idea for a minute of how different men and women are. Just take a, a sneak peek at the screen for a minute. It's just there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't. Try to see things my way. If you're offended right now, please don't send me email this week. It's just in fun, all right? It's just in fun. We're not all the same. We don't always even fully understand each other. And sometimes we don't make life easy on each other. But here's the point. To really thrive in life requires that we learn how to value the other people in our lives. That we learn to recognize the great worth of those who are in our oikos, of those who surround us every day because we value things that we honestly believe have worth. Now, this is a little counterintuitive to thriving because we might think to ourselves, the best way to make sure we thrive is to make sure that all of that which we place value on life is focused back in on ourselves. But no, Jesus says to us, no, to thrive, understand how valuable everybody else is and treat them as such. It's time to stop seeing people as lost causes and start seeing them like lost treasures. Waiting to be found. This is exactly what Jesus demonstrated and exactly what he called us to do. First, he called us to love like he loves. He said it in verse 12, love each other as I have loved you. What a thought that he loves us. What a thought that God has looked down at every single one of us and said, I value you. I treasure you. I prize you enough to give my life for you. Can I tell you something? If you don't recognize your intrinsic value because of who God says you are, you'll never figure out how to value anybody else. Because we apply the truth of God's love for somebody else once we've understood it for ourselves. That I am a person of worth because God says I am, no matter what somebody else has ever told you. And then you say, so too, my husband, my neighbor, my boss my teacher, my student, is precious to God and valuable. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would give us eyes to be able to spot value in people. Diane and I have a, a pastor friend named Mark Lale. When we met him years ago, we discovered that one of the ways he was supplementing his income was he knew how to go and find treasures at yard sales. Now, how many want to raise your hand and say there is no such thing as a treasure to yard sales or anyone in the room like that? You all a bunch of yard sellers or you're just afraid to lift your hand because your wife's going to nudge you or something? <laughs> but what Mark would do 
is Mark had studied and knew all about fine china. He knew all the brands and all the patterns and all the values. And he would go to a yard sale and he'd go over to, you know, where they got the, the two saw horses set up with a piece of plywood and all the piles of the assorted glasses and cups and, and china. And he knew how to sort through the grocery store china and how to find a saucer or a teacup or a platter that was of genuine value. He knew it was probably going to get pitched if it didn't sell that day or the people were going to just take it down to the goodwill and he'd look and make sure it was in perfect condition and then he'd walk up and offer 50 cents or a dollar and take it home where he had a magazine of companies that told what they were looking for. You know, there's entire companies based on the realities that sometimes you and I are butterfingers <laughs> and you have a set of 12 of your precious china and you drop one and now you got 11. And you can find companies that will replace your missing plate or your missing saucer. So what he does is he takes the 50 cent cup and sells it for $10 to that company that turns around and sells it for 45 to you when you need it. And you see, he had the capacity to see value where others didn't see it. Underneath the, the dust and, and the dirt and, and, and tucked in next to the plastic Superman cup, he could see the intrinsic value of that item. So many times we struggle to see the value of people who are the hardest to love because they're covered with the most dust and the most junk and the most difficulty. They're the ones that have been tucked away into the darkest corners, hardest to find. And they've made themselves that way. Oh, that God would give us eyes to see value when others don't. This last Christmas time, the Sunday after Christmas, we were up in Lancaster as a family. We were all there, Diane, myself, all of our kids. Diane's mom, who I take with her because I adore and love her greatly, was with us. And um, why are you laughing? I didn't make a joke. I thought of three. I've made none. I'm being good. <laughs> Things are being recorded and going places where they're defensive of mother-in-laws. I don't know, but both of my parents were there. It was wonderful family time. And on Sunday morning, we were sitting down in the semi-large breakfast area there, and we had put in our orders for things that we wanted cooked. And we were sitting in this restaurant getting ready to eat some breakfast and then go on to church. As we were sitting around the table, and the restaurant was maybe a third to half full, and there's just kind of the normal low murmur that goes on as people talk socially appropriate volumes in restaurants. We began to hear this one little girl. She was probably maybe nine years old, I'm going to guess. Skinny little thing, blonde hair, cute little girl, sitting over, looked to me like with her parents and maybe both sets of grandparents or, or something, and, and they were at a table, and she was talking just a little louder than socially appropriate. She was, wasn't jumping up and down on the table. She wasn't rolling around on the floor, frothing at the mouth. But, but she was just saying things like, when's our food coming? And I'm really hungry. And why doesn't our waitress come sooner? And, and oh, I hope it's coming soon. And my first thought was, wow, these parents need to kind of get a hold of this girl. But as Diane and I were watching, because we were seated in a place where we'd look right across and see, and our food was coming, began to grasp that perhaps she had some kind of condition. Perhaps somewhere in the wheel of Asperger's or, or somewhere in the line of autism. We've dealt with some of those things in piano lessons and other times in our life. But just, just something that caused her just not to quite be there socially compared to what we normally expect of everybody. Because my wife and I have, have a theory. I want to share it with you real quick, and it's this. When we meet people that so clearly have issues that are way beyond the scale of what we normally see, we make room for those people. We make room for them. It's very obvious. But when we meet people who are just... How do you say it? Just, they're just a little different. They're, they're just a little down the road from what we normally see as the normal. We don't make space for those people. We look at them and say, what's wrong with them? We look at their parents and say, what's wrong with you? Come on, church, you know what I'm talking about? 
And here's this girl. I looked at the parents and I can see the wear lines on their face. They love this girl. They're interacting with her well, but I can see that undoubtedly there are days it's an exhausting task. So as we're sitting there eating, their food comes. My wife finished up. She said to me, honey, I'm going to go up to the room and finish getting us packed and ready to head out to church. I said, that's fine. And she said, where's your wallet? Can I have your wallet for a minute? Now, I didn't think that was that out of a request. It's not the first time I've ever gotten that request from my wife, but... Um, <laughs> I knew it wasn't the shop because it's Sunday. She doesn't shop on Sunday. And, and, uh, but she grabbed my wallet and looked in, and she pulled the dollar bill out and handed it back to me. Without telling me what she was going to do, she got up, walked out of that restaurant, walked over to the middle of the restaurant, I should say, there, and leaned down to that little blonde-headed girl and whispered something into her ear. Handed her that dollar bill, smiled at the parents. My wife turned around and walked out of the restaurant. I found out later that what my wife had said to that girl was, here's a dollar I want to give you just for being such a sweet girl. I know your parents must be very proud. God loves you. She gave her a little squeeze and walked out. What my wife never got to see was the eruption of joy from that little girl. You think she'd been noisy earlier? Oh, man. There was no stopping her now. She looked at her parents. She said, that lady just gave me a dollar just for being a sweet girl. Who does that? <laughs> she got up. She went over to her grandparents. She said, look, I just got a dollar. What am I going to do with this dollar? She said, I'm a sweet girl. She went to her other grandpa and said, I got a dollar, did you see this, for being a sweet girl. And then she went over to her parents and she said, can I tell her? And in the next table over, there was a completely different family, beautiful Korean family sitting there. This little blonde-haired girl goes running over and taps this other girl who looked about the same age. And she looked up, tightly wound little pigtails. And the blonde girl said, look. Someone gave me a dollar just for being a sweet girl. And that little Korean girl smiled at her and said, hey, that's great. Eventually, that family finished up eating and went on their way. My guess is to go spend that dollar. <laughs> I looked over at that little Korean girl, and I pulled my wallet out. <laughs> And I prayed for the miracle of God, let there be another dollar in there, because it was the last day of our vacation. <laughs> What's the chances? <clears throat> and there was a dollar bill in there, and I pulled the dollar bill out. Now it was my turn. And I went out, and I found that little Korean girl sitting there at the table. And I leaned over and I said, you know what, sweetheart? Thank you for being happy for that girl. It just shows you're a really sweet girl, too. I handed her a dollar and smiled at her parents, and I said, God loves you. And it was my turn to leave. Why do I tell you a story about two little girls and two dollar bills? Because God used my wife to help me see. You see, if we're going to love like Jesus loves, then we have got to be willing to see what others do not see. When you love people, you see what others don't see. On that day, there were plenty of people, myself included, who very easily could have seen that little girl as an interruption to my Sunday morning breakfast. But I'm so glad my wife helped me see what God sees when he looks at her. I want us just to bow our heads here, right in the middle of this sermon for a moment. God, would you give us eyes to really see people? Especially people that are already in our oikos, who have exhausted us or frustrated us. 
Help us to remember that you told us to love others the way you have loved us. And somehow, God, you looked down, saw past all the dirt and the Mars and the junk, and saw that we had value. May we see others that way. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Secondly, if we're going to do as Jesus did, we need to serve like he serves. Say that with me. Serve like he serves. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. You see, the next step in valuing somebody goes beyond just how we feel about them, beyond just letting God work inside of us. But now we say, okay, God, how do I get involved and make a difference? Look, every person here at some point experiences pity in life. Every person here at some point goes out and does something nice. But it seems to me as Christians, if anybody, we ought to be the ones who take it to the next level. Come on, am I right? We ought to be the ones, Jesus said, do what I command. You know, the amazing thing about serving is that it turns out that Jesus was pretty fond of referring to himself as a servant. He regularly said, the Son of Man has come to serve. He said, I am among you as one who serves. And that term there that he used is the idea of someone waiting on someone else. That word that Jesus would use for himself, servant, the word that Paul picked up from Jesus and used for himself, servant, the Greek word for that literally is slave. Well, now there's an image. A God who serves. In fact, let's, let's play a little image game this morning real quick. If you've got to close your eyes to do it, you can. You're watching the video, you can close your eyes. I want you just to get a mental image. I give you two words. You get a mental image after each word. The first word is celebrity. Get a mental image when you hear the word celebrity. The second word is servant. Likely you got two very different images from those two words. But I need you to understand something. The disciples had both of those potential realities on their radar screen. They did. When they were with Jesus, there was a very real potential they were going to become celebrities. Do you know why I say that? Folks, it is not an exaggeration to tell you that at the height of Jesus' ministry, he has celebrity status. People are coming from all over the place to see him. Man, he's got rock star status is the term we use today. People would line up to see him. They would love to get close enough just to reach out and touch him, one scripture says. Another scripture says he was so popular that people were pushing in to get to him, they almost literally pushed him back into the sea. One story tells us that Jesus is with this crowd, and when he's done with them and dismisses them, he gets into a boat. It's evening. He starts across the water. Instead of those people even going to bed, they spent the night running all the way around the lake so that when Jesus gets off the boat, he turns and says to the disciples, man, all these crowds are starting to look the same. And Andrew, who we know, and Philip, who were the calculators of the group, went, uh, I think their ticket's already been punched once. And now he's got all the crowd from last night and all the crowd from today. And here was the disciples' thoughts. It would have been your thoughts and mine. How did we luck into this guy? He was the one who told us to leave our nets and follow him. We simply agreed. Matthew says, man, I thought I was rolling in it when I was a tax collector, but I decided to follow Jesus. And you know what? If everything goes as it appears to be going, do you know what's coming our way? Popularity and power. He's going to become the ruler. And guess who all of his right-hand men are going to be? They're going to be us. And do you know what comes with status and popularity and power? Money. In every culture, money follows it. Understand, realistically, on the disciples' radar screen is the possibility of genuine celebrity. But then, Jesus keeps saying, I've come to be a servant. I've come to be a 
servant. And then he demonstrates that to them. He washes their feet when they're unwilling to wash each other's feet. Because get this, when you serve people, you do what others don't do. See that? When you serve people, you do what others don't do. You see, I'm wondering, are you willing to do things no one is doing to reach someone no one is reaching? You know what I'm saying? The people who outserve the other people are the people of greatest impact on this world. I'm talking about real eternal impact. People who outserve everyone else have the greatest impact. So catch this. Turns out, celebrity and servanthood were both on the radar screen for the disciples. Celebrity went away. They ended up being servants. Sometimes we pick on the disciples that they were slow to catch on to Jesus' words. But I want you to know something. Eventually they got it. And by the first generation after Jesus has ascended into heaven, the calling card of the church of Jesus Christ is not how politically connected they are, not how wealthy they are, not how impressive their theology is. The calling card of the church is how loving they are and how they will serve and do what no one else will do. When plagues come, it's Christians who will bury the dead. When sickness comes, it's Christians who will go and put a cool cloth on the brow. It's Christians who became famous for sharing what they had with others in a world where food was scarce. It was Christians who did those things. And the mantra of the world became, look at how they love. They were willing to do what others wouldn't do. So here's what happens. The Christians travel out into a world that's never heard of Jesus. They'll go into the cities that's where they went, to the great crossroads of culture, where there's every, every theory and every belief and every religion and paganism of, of every stripe and immorality running rampant. And now they walk in and teach this new teaching. And these people have not heard of Jesus. But guess what happens? They may not know who Jesus is, but they meet these Christians who say that they are imitations of him. And they say, we don't yet know your God, but we sure do like his children. And I think we would like to know your God. You see how that works? You see, we always say that when you know God, then children should become like him. How interesting it is that people who are looking for God look at us, that they might discover what our God is like. That should thrill you and scare you to death simultaneously this morning because it does me. Sends a chill down my spine and then right back up. Well, nothing's changed. Let me see your phone, sweetheart. Folks, we don't have to travel into the city to get to the crossroads of culture. We carry it right in our purse or in our pocket. If you tell someone about Jesus today, by the end of your conversation, before they get in their car and ride home, they can look up every other world religion they want. They can get every opinion you can imagine on anything. They can see and read and learn about anything they choose. The crossroads of culture is right in our own hands every day. And I would insist this morning that what was true in the first century is true in the 21st century. That those who love and demonstrate what God is like will win the day. Anybody with me? But that's how it begins. Now listen, we don't back off from the truth that people's greatest need is the forgiveness of sins and the beginning of new life in Christ. I don't mean that we love blindly. We love with an undying love because the truth of Christ and what we have to offer will flow through us as we love and then tell. It's Christ's love that compels us to live this way. That's how it works. And so in Euroikos, 
you must serve as he serves. Because it won't be your persuasiveness. It won't be your power. It'll just be your serving. Now let's bow our heads. Let's pray about this. Lord, please just impact our minds this morning in this room with what we need to be willing to do to serve you. Thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to have to love like he loves. We're going to have to serve like he serves. And finally, we're going to have to do like he does. Well, you might want to grab the chair in front of you and brace for this one. Because John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus, by the way, in the next verse says, I've called you friends. And he laid down his life for them. Go figure. Try to grasp this today. That the greatest person in all of the universe laid down his life for you. It's beyond what we can comprehend. He valued us so highly. He came, here's a term that he used for himself, as a ransom for sinners. What's a ransom? A ransom is a high price you pay to set someone free. What a high price he paid to set me free. What a high price he paid for you because of his love. Because Jesus knew that our only hope was in his sacrifice for us. There was no other way for us to be set free except for him to do it. This is how he said it in John 12, 32. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. I want you to catch this. We talk about him being a servant, so he goes as low as he can go for us. That's the direction down, right? But then he's lifted. What direction? Up from the earth, referring to his death. And when he is lifted up, he draws people to him. Well, what direction does that mean he draws us? Up. He lifts us up. You see, when you lay your life down, you lift others up. When you sacrifice, is so that others can be brought up. American educator and presidential advisor Booker T. Washington once said it this way, there are two ways to display your strength. Push people down or pull people up. Are you willing to sacrifice? The likelihood that you will be asked physically to die for someone else is small. It could happen. But I believe there's a sacrifice mentality here that says, I can sacrifice of myself so that others could be lifted up. Well, in a moment, we're going to take communion. But before we do, let me just say one last thing. We all know what the universal emblem of Christianity is, don't we? What's the universal emblem for Christianity? The cross, right? We have one on the back wall. There's a beautiful one over here to my right. The cross. Been associated with the church for thousands of years. Can you imagine if there had been a PR group that had existed in Jesus' day? And after he's resurrected, the disciples go to this PR group and they, they say to them, you know what, we got to get this Christianity thing moving forward. We decide, you know, if we had a good logo, man, if we had a good emblem, this would help us. So I think we've decided on the cross. Do you know what that PR group would have told them? Anything but that. <laughs> no way. Not a cross. Do you know why? The cross is for losers. The cross is for the powerless. The cross is for the despised. The cross is for the hopeless. The cross is for the worst of the worst. The cross is for dying, not living. 
They said, how could you ever preach a series on Thrive and talk about a cross? No way. Don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But yet, you wear it on your jewelry. You have it on your Bible. Some of you have tattooed it somewhere on your body, so you'll never lose it. It'll never go away. I know, some of you have tried. You can't, you can't make those things go away. How is it we embrace that? Because we recognize that Christ's sacrifice, that lowly, unimpressive cross, is that in which we glory today. We rejoice over it because it's the source of our life. His sacrifice has set us free and given to us real life. And so we wear it and we celebrate it and we plaster it over everything that we call Christian because of what he has done for us.